Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. And for those who are online, uh, good morning, good night, good evening. I don't know exactly who is watching. Um, but I wish you a warm welcome to this session in which we will present um, three of the many innovative uh, ideas and, and, and uh, practices that will be are presented at this conference. Uh, we will um, yeah, have some headlights on, on these three. And we also have uh, representatives of two organizations who will um, say something about how they could support uh, these initiatives uh, to grow and, and disseminate their findings uh, to other places. Um, my name is Luc de Witte. I'm here as, as president of the Global Alliance of Assistive Technology Organizations, and that's one of the organizations that tries to pick up some of the great ideas that we see here and, and use our uh, global network um, to help, to try and help uh, grow these ideas and, and expand them it, and dis disseminate them to other parts of the world. Um, we have a very um, uh, simple program. Uh, we'll start with a short presentation by my colleague uh, Evert-Jan Hogerwerf, who is Secretary General of the GATO uh, organization. He will tell something about the organization and, and why we think this is important and what, what we do here. Uh, then we have uh, three uh, presenters who will um, yeah, present their innovations. Um, two are physically here and the other is online. Uh, and after that, uh, uh, Catherine Holloway, Holloway from, <laughs> sorry for that, <laughs> uh, from, from the GDI hub in London will also talk about how they can help and, and help develop ecosystems to make these things flourish. Well, that's the program. I hope you will enjoy it. Um, well, I think that that's all for me. Let's, let's get started then. <laughs> Evita, may I invite you to present something about uh, Gato. Yes, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, can I have my presentation? Uh, my name is Evertan Holgewerf. I'm the Secretary General of the organization that Luc just uh, mentioned, the Global Alliance of Assistive Technology Organizations. And as the name says, it's an alliance. It's a formally established association that brings together different uh, organizations, professional organizations working in the field of assistive technology. What our members have in common is that their primary focus is on assistive technology um, and uh, that they have that members so and work in the field in a uh, non-for-profit uh, approach or non-for-profit logic. Um, we started uh, about two, three years ago now. Uh, actually, uh, collaborations were already going on before, but it was formally established in 2000. Uh, and we are based in, uh, in Geneva. Uh, our, our aims are to advance assistive technology. So what we have in common here in the room is that we are all very much concerned with how technology can support people with disabilities and older people to live uh, better lives. Um, and we believe that international collaboration is key to that. So we've always seen it as one of our missions to, uh, to collaborate with other international organizations and through our members at the national levels to promote access to assistive technology. We do research, policy advocacy, education, training, or at least that's what we uh, want to do as far as we don't do it yet. Next slide, please. Um, here you can see uh, who our members are. Um, there, there is a little bias towards the, uh, let's say, the, the, the white Anglo-Saxon richer part of the world, so North America and Europe, but that's not entirely true. We also have members in uh, the Far East, uh, Australia, uh, Argentina, and uh, we are supporting, that's because we see that as one of our missions to develop professional AT organizations in countries where these don't exist yet. Uh, we have formal collaboration agreements with the World Health Organization, with the World Federation for Occupational Therapists, with Safety Children, and, and that's also the main reason why we are here, with the Zero Project. <coughs> Further, we have some affiliate organizations, among which the Global Disability Innovation Hub and Raising the Floor. Next slide, please. Um, 
can I have the next slide? Okay. So what have we achieved so far? Um, we, our, our efforts uh, left to a couple of publications. Uh, we have a biannual report that you can find on the website with the uh, uh, narration of our activities. We implemented a, a big uh, global effort to understand what are the main challenges in assistive technology outcomes and impact. And there's a report about that as well. Uh, we wrote uh, a publication, and there are copies here if you're interested in front of the, uh, at the end of the session, you can get your copy of a report, a sector report on assistive technology together with the, uh, the Zero project. And uh, a couple of us wrote scientific articles about access to AT worldwide. We organized policy sessions during conferences, and we uh, tried to implement uh, with our members and uh, through linking our members uh, collaborative work uh, in different areas of AT. Uh, more recently, we we're working on a scoping review looking into service provision challenges, and uh, that is work that we do together with the Global Disability Innovation Hub and the World health organization and the aim is to come to, to lay the basis for guidelines in AT service provision. Um, the last slide, that's more about uh, why we are here, a part of, of keeping, uh, let's say, the work going on with the Zero project. We are happy to work with them because they have a, a, a clear core interest in uh, the identification of good practices in the use of technology that support people with disabilities and to disseminate the good practices um, and also to try to identify mechanisms to support the upscaling and the transfer of good practice between countries and between organizations. So that's actually everything I had to say. Uh, and uh, so I pass the floor back to Luc who will further chair the session. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much, Eva John. I think that's a clear description of the organization, and I hope we can get back to that a little bit uh, when we have a discussion after the presentations of the, the other speakers. Um, I think we now go to the online uh, speaker, uh, which is Samuel Prull. It's a very difficult name. I, I dare not to, to really pronounce it, but you can do that yourself much better than I. <laughs> Um, so maybe you um, can just introduce yourself and, and tell us about uh, Fable Upskill. Um. Absolutely. Um, I've also got some slides. Uh, good job with the name. The L uh, and the X uh, are, are silent. Um, it's a name that every screen reader you uh, mispronounces. So uh, <laughs> anyhow. Um, hey, everyone. Well, I'm sad not to be here. Uh, in person with all of you. Uh, I'm so glad to be here on behalf of Fable, and I'm so pleased at the recognition that we could have So we, have any, we, we don't really hear you properly. There's some, something wrong in the connection. You, you, in the start, uh, we heard you, and then suddenly you left. Uh, you, I don't think it's on my end. Yeah, this is perfect. Thanks. Ah, okay. Um, I'll take it from my uh, <clears throat> Um I'm sick. As a disability defense group, we're having the same problem again. Sorry, I don't know. Is there anyone who? could explain how this could work. Who? Sorry? Yeah, let, let, let's, let's try to establish a good connection. Um, uh, so let, let's take one of the other speakers first, uh, and then we get back to you. Is that OK? Because we just don't hear you. That's OK, sorry for that. We'll, we'll get back to you uh, after the next uh, speaker. May I then um, invite, the next is, um, yeah, my, my neighbor, Elizabeth Janikowski, Janikowska. Um, and you will tell us about the, the best online assistant. Yes, of course. Uh, hello. Okay. 
Hello, everyone. It's a great honor for me to be here uh, with all of you and share my work here. Um, Best Online Assistant is uh, three in one. My name is Elisabeta Jovanovska. I'm a founder of Brand Solution and a creator of Best Online Assistant. I'm coming from Macedonia and this solution we already implemented in our country. Best Online Assistant is a three-in-one uh, web platform for education, training, career development, and employment for people with disabilities. We are bridging the gap between companies and people with disabilities. It's a product created from the great need for digital workers caused by the new digital economy. And with the platform, we are solving the company's problem for finding qualified digital workers. We saw a massive opportunity for employing people with disabilities and, they, and that they can be a perfect fit for these jobs because they were already available because of a big unemployment, have a massive desire to learn and work and prove to society that they can create and give value. And with the, with the right approach, they can gain digital skills. After that, we started matching them with the companies, and by that, we solved the problem of the business sector. We started small, but our vision is to become a global place, the main uh, where people can be educated and qualified with the most attractive and trending digital skills. First, we regret how it works. First, we regret people for a course or already with knowledge of freelancing. Open them, they are opening their profiles on the platform and after that we are connecting them with the companies that need freelancers or people with disabilities for full-time employment. Why we consider itself that we are unique? Because we uh, connected education and different model of employment for people with physical disabilities by removing barriers and infra uh, so infrastructure problem are no longer problems. Uh, also, the, we didn't want to be just a website that provides just regular courses. We put that on a, bit, on a higher level and we certified the courses with the international verified diploma. This gives a, a huge opportunity to people from any parts of any country, or of any part of the country, not only the capital, to become active in the labor market, which respond to the economic trend of needed workers. Since we are coming uh, from the business sector, and originally we were, uh, and we are a marketing agency, we made a smart marketing strategy, and we showed that the, to the public that people with disabilities can be part to the society and actively contributing it. We created an environment where people actively participate in public events. Successful people with disabilities started to motivate other people and to show to the companies their capabilities. Most important, companies started to showing the result of their work inclusiveness and um, uh, productivity. By that, we provided, we proved to other people and companies that people with physical disabilities are the same as them. So, uh, professions like working in, uh, like working in a call center, digital marketing specialists, data entry agents, copywriters, social media administrators. E-commerce now are very attractive and all of those professions you can find on our web platform and you can engage people. We are currently training new groups of, for digital marketers. People started earning for themselves by choosing a model of work that fits their time and interest. From different cities from the country by promoting opportunities of work from, ho from home full-time, remote, or part-time. We are very proud of our su success in our country. Offering skilled profession, because we, uh, we are very proud because we made a significant um, uh, change with the low bodies and companies. 
offering skilled professional, uh, professionals with disabilities to the companies and making step-by-step -step easier path for them to claiming benefits from the country by em employing people with disabilities resulted with high demand for our workers from the business sector. The National Agency for Employment in Macedonia supported us as an attractive provider of services and matchmaker, so they are recommending us. We receive a recommendation from the president of the country and the government that with our model we gave solution to the country problem of employment for these groups of citizens. So we signed agreement with the government for using our services and our people. Municipalities in different cities in the country started employing our training to our train people and after that we started ex expanding our business in Bulgaria and starting to replicate the model in our neighbor country. Uh, the platform is self-sustainable so far. We charge companies uh, from transaction made from free, uh, freelancers and a subscription model from uh, companies who want to hire people full time. But of course we are open for collaboration for franchising, grants, funds, investors, associations, and many other partnerships. Of course, the digital economy enabled the active inclusion of people with disabilities to work from home. So with that, the differences, discrimination, and infrastructure problems are reduced, and opportunity is given to a whole new target of workers that have not been offered to the labor market before. Scale, we want to scale up our business by entering the European, then the global market. Our vision is to have a database of 40,000 active freelancers and job seekers within five years to be offered to more than 10,000 companies around the world. For that, of course, we need funds to create more programs, to create, uh, to create and provide more trainers in different countries, to upgrade the platform and mobile app, and of course, we need your support to recommend us and to join our platform. Thank you very much for your attention and joining us, because together we can create a world without barriers. Well, thanks a lot. That's uh, quite an ambitious um, presentation from 40 to 40,000 in five years. Um, 40 has been 42 in four months. Okay, well then, it, it makes <laughs> perfect sense. It's a straight line upwards, it's good. Yes. <laughs> no, but I, I think that ambition is fantastic. So thanks a lot for that. For the audience, we will have a time for discussion and questions afterwards. Uh, but let's now continue um, with the next speaker. Is the connection... Um, with Samuel now all better, is that restored? Uh, I certainly hope so, can I be heard? Okay, maybe there's something with the focus of your microphone, so don't move when you talk. <laughs> uh, please go ahead. Oh. All right, um, hopefully, let's, uh, let's hope the uh, connection st stays uh, stable. Um, hey everyone, well I'm sad uh, not to be all in person. Uh, oh, I think we have the wrong slide up. Uh, can we slide one? No, that's the wrong presentation. Ah. Yes. Yes. Okay, I'm good. You're good. Okay. Um, hey, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm really wishing uh, that I was there in person in Vienna. Uh, I feel like things would uh, perhaps be a little bit easier. But nevertheless, uh, I'm really glad to be part of this conference on behalf of Fable. And uh, so pleased with the recognition that we've been awarded on uh, for, by the Zero Project. Um, as I said, I'm Sam Prue. I'm Fable's accessibility evangelist. As a completely blind screen reader user myself, the goals of the Zero Project are close to my heart. I've been with Fable for our entire five-year journey, and, you know, what a journey it's been. Next slide, please. Before I dive in, 
let me start by telling you a bit about me. We often describe ourselves as being powered by people with disabilities. That's because the community of people with disabilities is central to absolutely everything we do. As the saying goes, nothing about us without us. And that goes double for creating accessible products and helping organizations to move beyond compliance. We enable some of the largest organizations in the world to integrate the voices of people with disabilities into their accessibility processes. To Spotify, to Walmart, we've been able to make a meaningful impact on products every day. I'm so sorry to interrupt you again, but but we have now the same problem. We we only see you talking, um, but don't hear you anymore. I, I don't know what's wrong, but but maybe you should need a, another microphone. Um, because I think that's... It seems to be when you're unmuting. Yeah, I didn't touch anything. Uh, hmm. Am I back? Yeah. <coughs> Someone can't hear you now himself, but then I can see them on the website. So okay. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a good suggestion from my neighbor. Um, would it be possible to, to record uh, your presentation and that we make it accessible through the website because this is, yeah, this is a bit disturbing. It's very sad, uh, but if we can't hear you, it's, it's very difficult. What, what do you think? Uh, yeah, we can try. Yeah, I'm, I'm so sorry, but then, because otherwise we run out of time and that, that's, uh, yeah, that's a shame for the other speakers. Sure. Um, uh, okay. Is that an acceptable? Okay, um, if, you, if you want to show the trailer on your end, that should work. Good. Okay, then, then. Most digital products have barriers for people with disabilities. But your product doesn't need to. Fable Upskill unlocks world-class accessibility training for digital teams. In order to talk about web accessibility, we also have to talk about disability. With Fable Upskill, your team will learn how people with disabilities use assistive technology to access your products. Courses are custom made for you, tailored to your products, tools, and design system. Then researchers, designers, and developers can learn the specific skills they need to contribute to building inclusive products. Every other person with a disability has a different need and a different perspective on it. Take the courses start to finish, or jump around to what you need when you need it. It's personalized, context-based learning, and it works. Level up your organization to build better, more accessible products with Fable Upskill. Make it fable.com slash upskill. Well, that is very helpful. Now we all have a connection where to look for more details. And um, I think this gives a good impression of, of what uh, the innovation is about. I'm very sorry that we cannot listen to your presentation further, but please record it and then we'll make sure that it will become accessible uh, very soon. Um, thank you very much. And, and please stay with us for, for possible questions at the end. Um, let's then continue to our third speaker. No, that's not that. It, uh, John, John it was, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> John Robinson. And he will talk about job stability. So again, a very, very similar topic about connecting people to work. Uh, please, John, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, my name is John Robinson. I'm president and CEO of Our Ability in the United States. Uh, my colleagues here from Canada, from Our Ability, Our Ability Canada and Ontario Disability Employment Network are here with, with me as well, as well as my wife. And so it's great to be, great to be here in Vienna. Um, audio description, I am a 54-year-old white male with brown brush cut hair, slightly overweight. Uh, I also happen to be disabled. I'm without the extension of my arms and my legs. I'm three foot eight inches tall, and uh, I share that with you because that's part of the experience of what, what we're doing. Um, I started this company some 11 years ago as a, a way to help myself a generation too late. 
Uh, I went to Syracuse University to study television, radio, film. I wanted to be in the media industry. And when I graduated in 1990, uh, I interviewed with television stations around North America and had multiple interviews over a four and a half year period and was unemployed. And as I went through that unemployment journey and eventually got a job in, the, in my chosen field, as I grew in my profession and started to speak to other businesses and started to talk about being a person with a disability publicly, the very few other people with disabilities inside corporate America that I would speak at would agree that the experience was, was universal, that the struggle for employment is real for people with disabilities. And so, uh, had a great 16-year career in TV, came home one day and said that I wanted to give back to my own community to learn and to create a business that would help our community find employment. And it's very important for me that it's a, it's a business. Uh, we are a corporation and that's, that's essential. Our ability started as a mentor network. We wanted to create a mentor network where we told video stories of people with disabilities that were successful and mentor younger people with disabilities through, through video uh, using my television experience. What ended up happening very quickly was the people that we would mentor, the younger people with physical and, and developmental and learning disability, neurodiverse, would ask us to help find a job. It became very transactional. They didn't necessarily want a mentor, they wanted a career, they wanted a position, which was the experience that I had. And then the businesses that I would speak at asked us if we could create a jobs board. And so, as I started this company 12 years ago to, to mentor, what ended up happening was we, we pivoted based on what, what the marketplace asked us to do. And so we created a very simple jobs board and we started accepting resumes and that was, that was fine. About five years ago, we were approached simultaneously by a, a major university in the United States that wanted to give us some students on a capstone project to, to code a solution. And Microsoft gave us one of the very first AI for Good grants towards accessibility. And so we started create, to create an AI platform that would ingest the information as people gave us resumes and ingest the information from the jobs board and start to make a marriage between the two, the two entities. And so as, as I sit here today, we have an artificial intelligence engine driven jobs platform called JobsAbility. And what JobsAbility does is take information in from individuals with disabilities around North America and growing. And what we lean into is interests and skills first. If you've ever looked for a position and you've been on LinkedIn or you've been on Indeed or any of the other platforms that talk about employment, the first question is what's your, what's your employment history? But the truth is, sometimes as a person with a disability, your employment history isn't what, isn't what you want to do. It's your skill to do a position and your interest to do a position. And so as we work through the jobs ability portal, we realize that interests and skills become essential. And then we work with approximately 70 plus businesses around North America and we have a data set of anywhere about 80,000 positions at any given moment. And so we make the match between what's written, what's truly written in a job description, what companies want to do, and we make an, an AI algorithm match between interests and skills in the positions. And I'll show you that in a minute, but it's really important for me that we create a bridge between our community of individuals with disabilities and anyone that may support us and the businesses that want to hire. In the United States, if you're a federal contractor or a federal subcontractor, and I know some of these statistics you know, go up and down amongst other countries, but if you're a federal contractor or a federal subcontractor in the United States, you need to be working towards 7% of your employment population as individuals with disabilities. And yet, it's a challenge. It's a challenge both that we present ourselves in a professional manner and that the businesses truly want to recruit. And what often happens is the job description is written so that it, it inhibits people with disabilities from applying and people with disabilities don't 
necessarily lean into what they want to do and what they can do, but have traditionally been about uh, where they worked before. We are people with disabilities. I am the owner of the company. I'm a quad amputee and I have, a, have the lived experience. My chief technology officer, Kartik Sani, is also a person with a disability. He's blind. And so he codes our system from that perspective and that's really important that inclusion is first and accessibility is first. And our board chair, Doug Hamlin, is a quadriplegic. And so we, we are people with disabilities leading a technology company for people with disabilities. And again, it's about building the bridge between the language of our community and our ability and what's written in the job description. Our candidate portal is JobsAbility, which I mentioned. Our public jobs board is OurAbility.Jobs. And we have upwards of nearly 10,000 views each month, close to that, and growing, which is, uh, which is amazing. We also, because we have 80,000 jobs at any given time, we're starting to parse the language inside job descriptions. And companies have asked us, can we write a better job description? So we've created an ableist language filter called Ably. And so right now we're building an ableist language filter that will plug in corporate America and their, and their computers as they're writing job descriptions to filter out hurtful language. And so we're excited about this technology that we've created all because I was looking for a position years ago. Our website, you can find us, the, he the headquarters at ourability.com. And again, you'll find jobsability either .com or .ca, depending on which North American country you're in, and then the job platform and the ableist language detector. This is what the jobs ability platform looks like, and you'll notice that we have the ably check mark next to those job descriptions that already are approved that do not have ableist language. Our jobs ability portal is a public portal, but once you sign in as a person with a disability, we need to give you a password, you log in. It's a private space that you're able to self-disclose your disability. I'm the only one that would see that. And it's really important for me that your trust, I, you trust me to be able to hold that information that you provide us to be true and private. And when you come into the system, you lean into your interests and skills and build a profile. And there on your dashboard in real time are jobs that are recommended just for you. We take those 80,000 positions that we have at any given time, and as you put your information in, we make a recommendation to you based on what's written in the job description and what's in your profile. We care very deeply that we are people with disabilities building a company, a technology company for people with disabilities in hopes that we lead our population to improve employment outcomes. Well, thank you very much. Um, well, that brings us to the last presentation of this um, session. Uh, before we go into discussion and questions, uh, Catherine, can I invite you to tell us about GDI Hub and what you can do in this space? Thank you very much, and that's a tough act to follow, John, so I'll, I'll do my best. Um, I'm Cathy Holloway. I'm the Academic Director of the Global Disability Innovation Hub, and for those who like audio descriptions, I'm a white, middle-aged woman that's going grey but still has some brown hair, uh, wearing a shirt and a suit uh, and glasses. Um, so we're, I'm going to talk today about accelerating AT innovation and some of the work that we've done with the global dis well, in the Global Disability Innovation Hub, which I co-founded, out of the UK to try and help build the sector. Oops, I could hold back. Uh, so GDI Hub came out of London 2012, which had more power athletes from more countries than ever before. That wasn't by chance, when the UK public were first surveyed about coming to the Paralympics, less than 1% of people said they would buy a ticket. When asked why in focus groups, they said, why would I want to go and watch those people? It was very othering language, and people's opinion, I think, of disability was very stigmatizing and wrong. But through a lot of hard work, and one of my co-founders, uh, Victoria Austin and Ian McKinnon, were part of that team, attitudes were changed. It was full for the first time, history was made, 
And I was lucky enough to be introduced to Vicky and Ian um, in 2016 when I had an idea to set up an, Excel or an assistive technology space where we would co-design assistive technologies together, but also elements of the built environment. And Vicky and Ian already had a plan for some work on policy and legacy in, from the London 2012 Games. We invited everybody that was moving to the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park in London, and sometimes people think London's very big and very exciting and full of money, but East London was not like that. People died of every, every weekend. It was a field filled of fridges and tires. It was very run down, and nobody wanted to invest in it. But there was a blueprint for transforming that space, and that blueprint needed public and private investment. And in order to get that blueprint, we needed the Olympics and the Paralympics. The greatest thing about the Olympics and the Paralympics in London 2012, far, far, far before Brexit, <laughs> was everyone felt very proud um, of what we were able to achieve in inclusion. And luckily, we managed to keep going with that agenda. We now work in 41 countries, and we've reached over 28 million people globally. Now, obviously, we can't do that alone. Um, and although we don't look sometimes like people with disabilities, our directors, we do um, are disabled. Um, and we have tried to work in partnership with people on the ground in every country we've worked in where we try to build capacity in both directions. We never assume that we know the answer. We always assume that none of us have the answer actually alone and that together we can be a powerhouse of insight, innovation and technical excellence. We're lucky enough to be housed within University College London and we have no, many, many um, partners across the world in academic but also in industry. So we've come up recently in a bit of a brainstorm, two day away day, with the idea that we are brave, creative and human um, and we try to live up to those values where we can. So to give you an idea of what we're doing, we're building an insights hub. Um, we've already got some level of insights. So we have population health data, thanks to Wei, who's sitting in the front here from the WHO and her great work of trying to get the RATA data to us. Um, but how do we link things like population health data, where we know where the need is for assistive technology or where there's unmet need globally, with brilliant innovations like those from Elisabetta and John sitting next to me? How do we begin to build that? And so the Insights Hub will do that um, and it will come uh, in April. We also do bespoke consultancy, so we find that people, um, we work with GATO on some research projects, but people like the World Bank or the Asian Development Bank, a lot of people are desperately trying to do good disability inclusion, both in the investment space, in building better infrastructure, in better fi finance accessibility. But oftentimes, it's difficult to infiltrate the systems, so we try to work with companies to understand what their stage gates are and how you can build in the parameters that will make sure that inclusion is is valued monetarily within project making decisions, but also isn't left as a guideline. We know that when accessibility is left with a guideline, people get left behind. Um, so there's some of the examples that we work with. Motivation, some of you will know, a wheelchair um, NGO uh, working across Africa and other countries and Asia. Um, and we have been working with them recently on their new, how to bring their new design to market. And also we co-author, well, we wrote the disability inclusive uh, education ICT landscape review with the World Bank. Our venture studio, um, some of you will have heard Bernard, who was here um, today and yesterday, he was up here on, on the speech, uh, opening, this, um, opening this wonderful conference. Um, and we have been working with Bernard and team in Kenya to develop an inclusive innovation ecosystem that will allow ventures to scale in Africa. We are working with partners in India to do something similar, and we work with partners in the UK. So now we're bringing that together into a sort of venture studio that will better help ventures go from country to country and from um, continent to continent. So it's a couple of quick uh, examples. One is Wazi Vision. Wazi Vision are fantastic. Two female entrepreneurs, absolutely great people. They had this idea for eyeglasses that would fit an African face better, that would be African designed. However, their technology wasn't scalable. They wanted to 3D print uh, d devices, then they wanted to use other manufacturing techniques. But we managed to get them partnered with a, a company in the UK that had already done CNC milling get them one CNC machine, get it shipped to Africa, and now they're scaling uh, brilliantly. Um, and we obviously have our Innovate Now, which I think you've heard about a couple of times, but obviously Bernard is doing a fantastic job there. So hopefully together, we can work together to change the world. Let's make it happen, and thank you very much to all the Zero Project and Gatto for having us here. Well, 
thanks a lot. Um, I think there's a lot of energy on this table and also in the room, of course, but uh, fantastic um, and, um, and, and really driven uh, presentations. Uh, now we have some time for questions, discussion, um, considerable time. Uh, may I maybe start first the, whether anyone on this table has any comment or question to any one of the others on the table? <laughs> before we go to the audience. Uh, yeah. I had one question for John, actually. So I, I saw something similar recently on gender, uh, it was gender and race inclusion and, and trying to get rid of racist language out of um, job portals. And I wondered if, if you're working at that intersection at all. It, it, it's, it's, I'm glad you asked that. Uh, part of the reason this came up was from a conversation with a couple of UK companies that asked us, you know, were we looking at, at gender inside job descriptions and it made us think about ableist language. So, you know, to us, we understand uh, ableism is, is strong, uh, which is not a good thing. And so what we're trying to do is to tackle that. And in that conversation, the other biases come out. As, as we have done focus groups and we continue to do focus groups, we realized that the other biases do show themselves. And so ultimately what we wanna do is lead with disability and the intersectionality uh, you know, with, with sex or gender or, or race will, will be part of that process as well. Yeah. If, if John, yeah. Yes, I have a question as well, both for John and for Elizabeth. Um, um, <coughs> those of us that work in, 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 in or support people with disabilities in finding employment <coughs> know how difficult it is not only to match uh, skills and interests and, and also um, to provide training, but that there's all the whole um, environment where people are going to work, which should be accessible, collaborative, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So my question to uh, both of you would be, how you work on the side of, of the matching persons, persons uh, skills and, and, and interests with job descriptions or you, you train people in getting uh, um, uh, <coughs> more professional skills to be able to, to work in a digital environment. Uh, but how do you, uh, or how do you cope with that challenge? Uh, do you also provide services that actually um, work directly with the companies to make sure that also on the, on the uh, receiving side there is uh, appropriate conditions created for people to be able to not only to find a job, but also to continue to work there. Well, I can uh, say from my perspective and from the uh, experience from my country, um, when it comes to employment for people with disabilities, the uh, problem is huge. Um, and um, most of the companies, they are not very much inclusive. But uh, when we train people, uh, we are giving them possibilities from the beginning to uh, answer on the new e-commerce things. So that's why we are uh, especially training them for uh, to be copywriters, social media administrators, to sell online. So uh, from when COVID started and everything moved online, so those people are in quite need and that enabled the, the uh, work, uh, enabled the places for people with disabilities do not have to go to the work. So we uh, somehow, we um, made the company inclusive by on the beginning not knowing about that and not facing directly the situation. The first result when they saw, I mean, of course they know when they employ people, but the, um, it, it wasn't that uh, direct discrimination uh, when, it, when it's happening when they go to work. Uh, and what happened, uh, our people show very good results. And after two or three months working, when they went on the party with a colleague and other team members on, of the companies, uh, that inclusion became normal. They, treating, they were treating the people 
completely normal, the same as them. So by that, we um, consider ourselves that we made a huge success, but not putting a pressure of inclusiveness, but just make inclusive place on its own. In the space that we that we're in in North America, uh, we end up talking a lot to dis uh, to diversity, equity, and inclusion (DE and I) people, and we understand that only four percent of DE and I written materials in corporate America and corporate North America only four percent have disability included, and so that gives us a, an amazing opportunity. Obviously, we can work with the four percent but we can also sell the 96%. Yeah. Uh, and so what ends up happening is with the 4%, they understand disability as part of diversity. And so it's an easy, easy conversation for us to say, you do need to include, include accessibility and recruiting in part of your DE&I. With the 96%, uh, obviously being people with disabilities ourselves, they will listen to what we have to say about being inclusive. Uh, we are not, uh, you know, we do training, but there are other organizations that do it as well. And so what we, what we say to every company is we want to work with each company that wants to work in recruiting individuals with disabilities. We want you also to work with others as far as internal training, as far as, as, far as job coaching or job shadowing or the, the services that are provided. There are so many wonderful disability organizations, including our partners around North America, that can do that as well. What we want to do is to be, be the conduit, be the, the place where, where each party communicates with each other on interests and skills, and increase that 4% of disability in DE&I up to 8%. And if we can do that, then, then we'll help the unemployment rate. Excellent. Uh, may I also ask a question to all three speakers, including Samuel, um, who spoke half. <laughs> yeah. Um, when I was listening to your presentations, I had the feeling, uh, especially with, with Elizabeth and, and John, um, that your initiatives are very complementary. So I thought, why not work together? Because then, yeah, you could in, in one step expand your idea. And that also applies uh, in a little bit different way to Samuel. But what do you think about that? Where, where do you see the complementarity? I think there is a lot of... Uh, comp complementary services here and and you know in r reading each other's bios and understanding fable before there is a lot of complementary services I mean to my my thought with this always was we needed to build it first and we needed to prove the scale of it you know right now we have 2800 full profiles in our system we have 71 companies we have 10,000 email addresses of people with disabilities and we've got 80,000 positions so we're here Excellent. Now, because we're here, we can we can partner with the right partners around around the world. Absolutely. Do, do, do you agree, Elizabeth? Absolutely. I mean, um, well, we started this project two years ago, launched our first and uh, employ our first people four months ago, and I can make a comparison uh, now uh, for everyone. The first call for uh, application for a jo job announcement. Uh, when it came to us uh, from the companies, we were looking for the people to apply for the job. Afterwards, three months later, when we um, uh, made an open call for employment, in, the, in two hours, hours, 11 people applied for the job. So uh, uh, it's very hard to find, find targeted organization and corporation to work together. But once you find it, find it it's uh, re really we can make a significant change. That, that sounds great. And I think you should have dinner together tonight or something to, to work on this. Uh, may, may I ask also, uh, Samuel, what, what do you think? How, so you, how do you see the relation with the other presentations? Um, I think it's two sides of the same coin because Corporations need training around accessibility so that people who become employed can be successful. But um, we need people with disabilities in those organizations to make any real accessibility change and improvement. So I think it's two sides of a coin and I think it's a virtuous cycle that we're all building on, on each other. 
Okay, so then I suggest that after your dinner, they will both talk, talk with you. Uh, yes. <laughs> one, one other question to the other uh, members at the, behind the table. Uh, uh, you talked about GDI Hub. Do, do, how do you think, from your organization, you could support these kind of initiatives and to, to, to grow? Yeah, um, I think I think we do support some some initiatives like this. I, I think there's we try to bespoke now increasingly our our offer to to ventures. So they need to have a, a gap that they need to, to be filled. I mean, from what I can tell, with what John and Elizabeth and Samuel are doing, that they're, they're growing their businesses very well um, and they're doing a, a great job. So we tend to work maybe slightly earlier stage um, and then also work at the ecosystem stage yeah. but equally if for example uh, John or Elizabeth came to us and said you know we're thinking about entering the, the UK market or we, we've heard there's a you know how would we link to the work that's happening in, in Africa or, or maybe can we get different languages for example John like you know there might be something that you want done yeah. or there might be a business venture that you know an angle that you need then, then we're there to to help and we also know the struggle so we do you know my PhD students and things do also have ventures that they're trying to build yeah. so we know that some things work and, and some things don't work and and um and sometimes you have to pivot like you that you did so well so yeah we're, we're here to listen and and where we, we can help we help and in other instances i'd be sending them for example to yourself or to, to gato i think sometimes yeah. it's not us and, and it should be somebody else and and so of course yeah, really. of course well, well i'll ask eva john as well but but you you heard her talking yes. okay good <laughs> eva john what, what do you think uh <coughs> Well, I think that one of the barriers in, in upscaling and transferring, especially transferring uh, good practice from one context to another or from innovative products or services from one context to another is um, uh, context sensitivity. So the and cultural differences. Um, maybe what Gato could do as, an, uh, as a global organization uh, we, with links to uh, a community of 80 researchers and 80 professionals is trying to um, provide a sort of a platform where that kind of issues could be could be addressed so we could consider setting up maybe groups of professionals in a specific area of the world whether this is far east or, or Europe or Africa or South America um, and um, to yeah, to sort of to 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 to, to assess the ideas uh, that seem very very promising, how these could work out in in an entirely different cultural context, uh, or an entirely different professional context, or how they could be used by different professionals that standing standing with different roles in the field. Uh, I think that's the big, the main asset that Gato has to offer, uh, being an um, um, uh, yeah, a uh, uh, pretty big international global community of 80 uh, experts. So, um, but you're the president, Luke, so maybe you should answer this question. <laughs> no, no, I, I can only agree with your answer because that, that's what Scato has to offer, a, a wide network also yeah, connected to academic centers, research groups, uh, experts in the, in, the, in the practical field. Um, so that, that's what we can try to... Um, yeah, to use as good as possible. Um, assuming that we should stop talking now, um, I'm really interested to hear questions, comments from the room. It's very hard to see you, but <laughs> yes, that is better. Okay, I see your hand there. <laughs> Please. Yeah. Um, oh, I think, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, hi, so I'm Kylie Shea. I'm the team lead for the Access to Assistive Technology team at WHO and I've really loved the presentations and in particular very excited by these the initiatives to get more people with disabilities into employment that they really care about like it's employment that's individual it's unique to their skills and their interests of course being in the role of team lead for assistive technology my question is related to assistive technology there's been a bit of discussion already about accessibility but in terms of the individual assistive products that people need in order to be able to engage in the workplace. What I'm curious about is, first of all, how important would you say it is that people can access the right assistive products in order to engage in employment effectively? And then 
how, how much of a barrier are you seeing it? And you've got two different contexts. So we've got um, Estonia, correct? You're, you're from, uh, sorry, Elizabeth, Macedonia. you're... Yeah. Macedonia, yeah. Yeah, uh, Macedonia. Yeah, Macedonia. Uh, my apologies. And, and, of course, in the US. So, you know, they're different contexts, but I'm curious about whether you both see it as a barrier, perhaps, maybe, we'll hear. Um, and then from the employer's perspective, how... How much are employers, in your experience, engaging on the principle of reasonable accommodation and supporting people to access the assistive products that they need to, be, to, to perform well in the workplace, which may well be different to the products that they might already have um, for their use at home and, and other environments? Um, thank you very much. Well, that's a whole range of questions, actually, but <laughs> go ahead, please. You know what's great about uh, about 2023 is that from a from a disability perspective, there certainly can be more products built that can help help us communicate, help us navigate, help us help us live. Um, and it's come it's come so far, right? You know, just walking around these last two days with my cell phone, which acts as my laptop, you know, and be able to voice dictate into the cell phone. I can I can work at the speed of business right now because of you know because of my iPhone. Um, and I would say that there are so many other products that we could build. You know, one of, the, one of the neat things about having the three of us who are all people with disabilities, we talk about what we would like to build. Uh, but as Caroline Casey said yesterday, it's great to have the new idea, but to stay in the product that you're working in is what we have to focus on. So I think it's going to be exciting what, what is built. And, and it needs to be built for our communities so that we can, we can work to the speed that we want to work at. And that's really important. We need to be the leaders in this as people with disabilities. From the business side, you know, we're in a, we're in a, a sort of a good period right now in North America, uh, in a, in maybe in a, for bad reasons, but people. And so that effectively helps us to have the conversation to add people with disabilities. It invariably gets to reasonable accommodation, uh, but the word reasonable is in that sentence. And what is reasonable is what we need to be working towards. And so businesses want productivity. And if, if voice, dicta voice dictation software or a separate iPhone is reasonable, then that, and that helps somebody work at the speed of business, then that's great. Businesses are open and welcome to accommodation as it's reasonable to get productivity. And that's the, the, the plus side of effectively zero unemployment right now, we can have those conversations to prove the return on investment that hiring people with disabilities provide. Samuel, you are on the business side. Um, yeah, you work on the business side. What, what, what's your perspective on this? Um, I, I think a lot of it really is about... Well, we don't hear you again. Sorry. No, I don't know what's wrong, but <clears throat> well, let's uh, maybe Elizabeth can uh, respond as well. Yeah, um, I agree on the side of the companies uh, with uh, John. We have no problem with companies right now. Uh, com uh, we have uh, higher demand than uh, supply for, of our workers. Uh, on the Balkan, there is a, a main problem um, that people with disabilities lost hope when it comes to employment. And um, what we need for the moment and what we are doing, we are motivating them that really and they can find a job uh, by a right approach and they can be fit into the society and into the companies. Um, by that, we are us uh, using uh, disability ambassadors. So by that, we are um, uh, answering the great need for people with the companies. Um, I also agree with the John. Yes, accessibility and all the tools are very important. And uh, maybe in the future, when we will grow bigger, uh, not maybe, for sure in the future, when, when, when we will go bigger, we will import tools and make 
uh, things more accessible. But for the moment, we have to make a balance uh, and to give answer to the company sec uh, to the business sector, which is our main goal, to provide workers for the uh, business sector. Thank you. Um, other questions, responses, remarks from the hall. Please don't hide behind your computers, just dare to say what you think. Uh, yeah, sorry for my hands, but otherwise I don't see you. <laughs> so, nobody. That can't, that can't can be I, true. Can I ask another question to, uh, yeah, to John? Of course, of course. Yeah. Uh, John, you, 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 sh you showed us uh, uh, quickly a slide with the profile, uh, so you collect information from people. Um, how, do, uh, how does assistive technology come in? I mean, do they describe uh, the technologies that they use? Um, uh, uh, I mean, are there any, and do you, do you provide other additional services around that? Do you advise people on how they could maybe further improve their uh, AT skills? Yeah, we, we do ask accommodation questions to each person that comes into the system. It's it's not the first thing that we ask. We, we lean into what do you want to do, what can you do first, and then, and then back down into what accommodations you need. For, for me, it's, it's all around the job function. So the business needs to ask questions around how are you gonna perform the job function, and the individual needs to respond, here's how I'm going to perform the job. And so we do ask accommodation questions, what you need to perform the job function. As far as assistive technology, no, we don't, we don't get into that inside the portal to date. If the marketplace asked us to do that, then we would do that. So if our, if our corporate partners wanted, wanted to have that conversation, that would be, we would love to plug into that, but they would pay for that. Um, and it would be at the service of the individual with a disability. So right now it's asking me, what do I need to be a salesperson at a television station? I would answer, I'd need a step stool for the bathroom, I'd need to be able to reach the photocopy machine and use voice dictation software. And that's the accommodation question that we ask. And then we can get in one-on-one -on -one into assistive technology. Questions? You had some time to think about it now. There's a question over there. Oh, there, yeah, sorry for not seeing it. Hi there, Please uh, go ahead. Hector Minto, Microsoft. Um, th there's getting a job and saying what assistive technology you want, but then there's the digital ecosystem that sits within the workplace is sometimes the barrier. So what you don't want to do is discourage somebody taking that job, but what we have to do is start to become realistic about the commitments those businesses are making to continue to make their ecosystem accessible. So are you monitoring the, the dropout when people are faced with some of infrastructure that is inaccessible? <laughs> Tricky question. Uh, we're monitoring everything. <laughs> How's that? Um, yeah, we know where people are where people are dropping out, and so that becomes a private conversation with the business on on what what is happening. That's kind of why the ableist language filter began began because we knew that the the point of entry of the job description was was working for some companies and not working for other, and then from there you can you can extrapolate on where we can go with the system. We are monitoring and working closely with our corporate partners on, on what is working, and, and we lean into what is working. And then with those that may not be working as well, we'll have that conversation with them. And there's no doubt, I mean, you know, we're, we're all navigating applicant tracking systems, we're navigating, you know, word processing, we're navigating cell phones, we're navigating all these systems, and there's data here that's to the benefit of the business that wants to hire and be inclusive and we, we can help them to a point on the systems that we see and, and uh, assist them in growing those systems. You know, it's always been my, my belief, sort of uh, my philosophy that you build on your strengths. So I don't try to train around weakness necessarily, but build upon the strengths. And so if something is working, we will promote that within that business and try to keep building on what is working. Any more questions from the hall? Yes, over there, please. I just have a comment. I think it's wonderful that there are people who are saying, what, is, what can we do? 
instead of saying, oh, I'm disabled, or I, I can't hear, instead of saying, what can we do and work on that? Because nobody is just a wheelchair or a, an ear or a hearing aid. We are all human beings with a lot of different aspects and a lot of different skills. That's all I want to say, just a little comment. <laughs> wow, thank you. I think we all share that, uh, that idea, it's excellent. And it's not only about what you can do, but also what you would, lo would, what you would like to do. Yeah. And I think that that's what I appreciated in John's command in the beginning, is this, well, we work based on the interests of people. So that is fantastic. Okay, any more comments? If not, then uh, I think we're going to conclude this session. It's a bit uh, 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 faster earlier than, than planned, but that's no problem. And no one will punish us for that. No. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for your presentations, your inputs. I think we have seen three fantastic examples of what can be done. And um, if you work together, we can even do more. And with the help of GDI Hub and Gato, uh, you can even expand it to the whole world and reach this not 40,000, but 400,000. Let's go step by step. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. And uh, well, uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks.